have you able to cover it? We're going to use the study guide today. So if you could just pass them on, give some to the sisters. And get started. <coughs> I got another one too. Can you know? Know. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Sallallahu wa Sallam, Mubarak, Ala Nabina Muhammad, Wa Ala Ali wa Sahbihi, Ajmain. So what I thought we would do to, uh, today is, um, I think one of the things that's making the course a little bit complicated is that there's no visual. Um, you can't, uh, if you don't have the book, you can't follow in the book. And so without the visual, it just makes it difficult, I think, especially with some of the terms and, and everything, to follow the material and to grasp the concepts. And I don't want to make it difficult. The whole purpose is for us to learn. So since that's the case, what I did today, uh, first of all, I thought we would do some review. We would review some of the things that we've uh, covered thus far. And in addition to, I have one more. Do you need one? Yeah. yeah. And in addition to doing a review, I brought a study guide. So you'd have the terms, you'd have um, uh, the information in bullet form, and you could take notes right there on the paper. And in addition to that, I'll try to do this weekly. So I'll just give you an outline, give you the information we're going to cover in bullets, and that way you have a visual to put with um, what I'm saying, and hopefully that'll help make things better. And we'll just go from there and see how things are going. So we'll start, inshallah ta'ala, with the first section. We'll just go section by section and cover what we can cover. So the first section. Um, is entitled Kitab al -Tawheed. So basically, as you know, the author, he opens the book with the words Kitab al and he doesn't put a chapter title. He doesn't give a chapter title to the first chapter, but rather he says Kitab al -Tawheed. And the scholars of Islam who studied the book and commented on it, they said that when you study that actual chapter, you discover that the intended chapter title, even though he didn't give a chapter title, the intended chapter title is Babu Wujub Tawheed al the chapter which basically explains or clarifies the obligation of a Tawheed or the mandatory nature of a Tawheed upon individuals. Okay? So now we'll look at that first or the, the book itself, and that first title, or that first wording, that first um, caption, Kitab al tawheed we'll look at that in those bullets that you see. So the first bullet, it says, why was the book written or compiled? Why was the book written or compiled? So why did the Imam Mujaddid, Muhammad ibn Dul Wahhab, why did he even write this book or compile this book? And the reason is because he lived at a time and in a region where the people had, for the most part, forgotten or abandoned a tawheed. They had abandoned the concept of monotheism. They worshipped trees, they worshipped rocks, they worshipped um, tombs. They went to the tombs and the mausoleums of dead people and they worshipped there. And they believed in omens. They wore tamaim, these charms and amulets, and believed they would protect them. And they had all other, they had a lot of other misconceptions and superstitions. And so, because of this, because they had they gone so far away from this fundamental principle or fundamental aspect of the deen, the Imam wrote this book, and he wrote other books to clarify this most important aspect of Islam, a tawheed. So that's why he wrote the book. So now you say, okay, well, this was centuries ago. Why is it important to study this book now? Okay, why do we need to study Kitab al Tawheed now? And the reality is that, Sahih, um, things may not be as bad as they were during his time in some places or in the place where he taught. But in other places in the Muslim world, there's a lot of the activity, a lot of the errors 
that he preached against still occur. And people who are from those countries will tell you that, for example, in many Muslim countries they have tombs, they have mausoleums, where people go in the thousands, people go maybe in the millions, to what? To worship the people in the tombs. So this still exists in the Muslim world. At the same time, even if people don't go to that extent where they're worshipping an idol besides Allah or a tomb besides Allah, there still are many errors that Muslims fall into which constitute the opposite of a tawheed, which is shirk, which we'll talk about. So it's important for us to study this because if we don't study it, we may fall into some of those errors which will do what? Which will violate or nullify our tawheed. And that's why the poet, there's a famous uh, line of poetry that's often quoted, and it basically says this, عَرَفْتُ الشَّرَّ لَا لِلشَّرِّ وَلَكِنْ لِتَوَاقِيهِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَعْرِفِ الشَّرَّ وَقَعْ فِيهِ So basically the poet, he says, I learned about evil, not for evil's sake, not because I just wanted to learn about evil, because I like to hear evil things. I learned about evil to avoid it. And whoever does not know evil is bound to fall into it. So we have to know the wrong things so we can avoid them. And many Muslims are ignorant about what? Those things which violate Tawheed. And as we start going through this book, the second part of it, you're going to see how inconspicuous a shirk can be. How easy it is for people to do things thinking that they're perfectly fine and in reality they're what? They're things which violate a Tawheed. So that's why it's important to study the book now. In addition to this, the author, Jazallah Khair, he provides us with some incentive. He basically provides us with some incentive to study a Tawheed. He tells us what makes it important. In addition to what we just mentioned, why is it important to study a Tawheed? So he gives you, he gives you five chapters. And in those chapters, he does what? He encourages you and says, hey, this is why you should study this. And you can see them in the bullets. The first one, he says, it's watching. He says, O oh Muslim, it's mandatory upon you to observe a Tawheed. So the first reason why you should be keen to learn about a Tawheed is because you have to. And if you don't do it, you'll be held what? You'll be held accountable by Allah. So that's the first reason. The second reason, it's Dhu Fabail. That this Tawheed that you're going to study and learn about and observe is highly virtuous and the one who observes it stands to gain a great deal in this world and in the hereafter. We mentioned that he has the chapter in which he says the chapter which clarifies the virtue of a tawheed and what it expiates of sins. And we heard how um, the people who have tawheed, that tawheed will be weighed in the scales on the day of judgment. And how you have a person who will come and he'll have sins which stretch. The scrolls which contain his sins will stretch as far as the eye can see and they will be so numerous. And those scrolls with all those sins will be put in one pan. And his tawheed, his statement, La ilaha illallah with sincerity will put in the other pan. And it will do what? It will outweigh the sins. So this is one example that he gave us of the fadl of a tawheed, the virtue of a tawheed. He also taught us, or he, he mentioned the ayah which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِمَانَهُمْ بِذُلْمًا أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمَنْ وَهُمْ مُحْتَدُونَ So he mentioned the ayah which Allah says, those who have faith, and what he means by faith here is what? A tawheed. They have this tawheed, this monotheism. وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِمَانَهُمْ And they didn't mix their tawheed with what? With dhulm. Dhulm here means a shirk. They didn't pollute or contaminate their tawheed with what? With polytheism or idolatry or associating partners with Allah. فَلَهُمُ الْأَمَنْ For them there is safety and security. They'll be safe. Safety and security, like I said, is something we can you don't. The person who can really appreciate is the person who's been deprived of it. Look at people, for example, we, we turn on the news, we see people in Syria. They're fleeing from the country, seeking what? Safety, seeking a place where they, can, they don't have to worry about being bombed, they don't have to worry about being looted, they don't have, they don't have to worry about their women being raped, etc. And this is the, the life that they live, just running from refugees, just looking for safe haven. A person who experiences that can appreciate the effect that Tawheed can have what on the person. It can give them what? An amen. 
fi dunya in this life, and also al aman fi al safety from what? From a nar, safety from the hellfire. So this is one benefit in this life and hereafter of what this tawheed. Then wa hum muhtadun, and they're guided, guided in this world, guided away from al from misguidance, guided away from shirk, from polytheism, guided away from al bid'ah, from innovations, in this world, and guided away from what? From the same things in the hereafter, and from the hellfire in the hereafter. So this is the thing that this, the effect, this is what he's mentioning to us, that this is the virtue of what? Of a tawheed. Then after that he said, in addition to that, the reward for the one who actualizes a tawheed, they become a perfect monotheist, is that not only will they enter paradise, but they'll enter paradise without, without what? What does it say? Without being reckoned or punished. Being reckoned or punished. And this is the effect of what, or one of the virtues of what? A tawheed. And another thing that he mentions to what? To encourage us to study a tawheed. And then finally, finally, he says, or he mentions another uh, encouragement, and that is that a to, the opposite of a tawheed. What's the opposite of a tawheed? A shirk is something that we have to be afraid of and strictly avoid. And the only way we can be sure that we're avoiding it is if we have sound knowledge of what? A tawheed and sound knowledge of its what? Its opposite, a shirk. Like we mentioned from the poet saying, I learned about evil, not for evil's sake, but to avoid it. And whoever does not know evil is bound to fall into it. So these are some of the, the, the points that the author mentioned to show us why we should study what? Kitab at tawheed Any questions about that section before we go on? Any questions about that section? Is that pretty much clear? Hmm. Pretty clear? Does the visual help a little bit? Alhamdulillah. Glad. Okay, so we'll keep this up, inshallah. Okay, let's go to the next one, the next section, which is defining a tawheed. Defining a tawheed. So now we want to know how should we understand a tawheed? What does it really mean? Um, and obviously, Tawheed is a, a legal term or an Islamic term, right? It's not necessarily a term that we use in common language, okay? So let me just say this. When we talk about terms, especially uh, in Islamic disciplines, there's different ways that a term could be defined. So one way it could be defined is what? Linguistically. How is it used in the language? Linguistically. What does it mean just as a word when people hear it naturally? What do they think it means? So I'll give you an example, like the word rat. Okay? So the word rat as a, a linguistic term in the language of English, what does that mean? Rat. <laughs> well, you can't define a word with the same word. Oh, well, no, 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 don't go there yet, because that wouldn't be in the language. That wouldn't be in the language. So, a, ra good, a rodent, it's a, a pest, vermin, something like that, okay? That pretty close? Yeah. Linguistically. All right, now another way that a word could be defined is it could be defined what? In a way which is orfi, in the custom of the people. The way it's, uh, I guess you could say the common usage, the usage by what? By the commoners. Vernacular, if you want. Vernacular, like slang, right? So if we use the same word rat in the vernacular, it wouldn't mean what? Vermin or pest. It would mean what? Yes, yeah, somebody who snitches. I smell a rat. I mean what? Somebody around here is telling on people, right? Perfect. So now we see how the meaning of a word can change given what? The context in which it's used and the way it's being what? Defined. Another way a word could be defined is what? Legally. Legally. Okay? In light of what? A particular law. So, for example, if we take in, in English, if we take the word suit, just suit, this is a word, linguistically, what does it mean? What's a suit? Huh? Well, clothing. It's clothing. It's a piece of clothing, usually made from the same fabric, top, bottom, and they're supposed to be worn together, right? Yeah. That's a suit, right? Yeah. Perfect. But, if it was used in a legal context, you say, I'm going to file suit against this person, okay? There's a suit against you, right? So then that would be what? Now that's what? Legal action. 
And the meaning is totally what? Different, because the context changes. Perfect. All right, and then if we follow that same pattern with an Islamic word, like as salat or salat, right? So salat in the language of the Arabs means what? It means a dua. In the language of the Arabs, linguistically, it means what? Dua, supplication. But legally, as an Islamic term, it would be what? What would be the meaning of salat? Prayer. It's that yeah. prayer that we make that starts with a takbir and ends with what? A taslim, mm -hmm. right? So that so the point I'm trying to make is is that a word could be um, defined in different ways, and depending on the way it's defined, will determine what it's 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 meaning. So when we say a tawhid, it's what? It's a term. It's a legal term. It's a it's a a term that's specific to a specific discipline, the, the discipline of aqidah, or the belief system. It's an Islamic term. So we're going to define it linguistically and what? Islamically. That's why you see those last two bullets we say, what, a tawheed linguistically, in the language of the Arabs. So a tawheed language of the Arabs, what? It means to make something one. one. To make something one, tawheed. To make something one or to single it, to make, to make it singular. That's what it literally means. Now, but a Tawheed Islamically, a Tawheed Islamically, let me scroll up here. A Tawheed Islamically, as a legal term, or in the terminology of Islam, it means what? Ifradullahi. The oneness of Allah. Okay, the oneness of Allah. Okay, that's not bad. That's not a bad translation. I'll take that. The oneness of Allah. But actually, if we say the oneness of Allah, that's something which is passive. You understand what I mean? Passive. A tawheed indicates what? An action is being done. It's active. So it's not just the oneness of Allah, Allah being one, but it's us what? Us making him one. Us making him one. Singling him out. So that's the key thing. The difference between the oneness of Allah is what? It's passive. But we need a tawheed implies an action is being done. That somebody is making Allah one. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. So when we say a tawheed, we're saying that we are singling Allah out. Okay, we're singling him out. It's like datum. Mm hmm? It's like datum. Datum? Yeah, it's like da saying datum. Datum, what does datum mean? I'm sorry, that's a new term for me. D-A-T-U-M. Okay. It's like the singular of data. Really? <laughs> Gee, I didn't know that. That's good. Okay, I guess, but... Okay, I, I guess you could you could you could understand it like that. But when we say a tawheed, what we mean is we are doing the action of singling Allah out. We're making Him one. We're making Him one. Okay, so now we're making Him one in terms of what? Kul ma bi, everything which is specific to Him. So this is what tawheed means. It means you single Allah out. Ifradullahi. It means you single Allah out in everything which is specific to Him. Everything which is specific to Him, you do what? You exclusively give it to Him. Does that make sense? That's what Tawheed means in what? In Islamic terms. So when people speak, whether they're talking in whatever the discipline is, if it's Islamic discipline, if they say a Tawheed, then they mean what? Singling Allah out in those matters which are specific to Him. Fight. All right. Any questions about that section? Am I too close? Going back up. You okay, so? Yeah. No, I don't. Actually. You want me to copy? You want to take mine? Make copy? No, no. Keep you sure? Keep going. Fight. Any questions about that section? This is the time. Yeah, Akhwat. Ask any questions. It doesn't matter what it is. So if you. So if you guys have questions, go ahead and ask. This is the time. Ah, it's Fadli, yeah. Okay. The definition of Atali linguistically compared to Islamically was what? Okay, so it linguistically means just to make something one. Okay. Just to make something one or to make it singular. Okay, so that could be anything. Anything you could make one. Okay? I had a plate full of cookies. And I made them one by eating them all, except one, right? <laughs> you could use that linguistically, right? 
I wouldn't advise you to do that, but I'm just saying, I mean, that you could do that, right? All right, so now the second one, Islamically, then, is what? It's specific to Allah, and we're saying we're going to single Allah out in that which is what? Specific to Him. Everything which is specific to Him. Got it? Okay. Any other questions, Ya Khuat? Ya Khuan, any questions? Everything clear to this point? Mumtaz. All right. So let's go to this third uh, third section. All right, so this third section is going to talk about a concept or revisit a concept that we touched on last week that I think lacked clarity. Um, we need to be, you know, make some, we need to clarify some things about that. So basically the first bullet it says, the shortest path and surest method to realize a Tawheed. So now we want to achieve this obligatory thing of what? Of making Allah one in those things which are specific to him. So what's the shortest path to do that? The easiest method to do that? It is through simultaneous nefi, which means what? Negation. Simultaneous nefi, negation, what? If bat and affirmation. So simultaneously we have to do what? Negate and affirm. Alhamdulillah. Does that make sense? Just in general. We're going to explain in more detail what that means. But if you want it, the easiest way for us to achieve what which our objective, which is to single out Allah and that which is specific to Him, the easiest way, the shortest path to do that is with what? A nefi negation. And it's bat affirmation. Okay? So what do we... Uh, yeah. Would that be uh, like zikr? No. It, it, actually, it's, it's something we're actually physically going to do. And it's not something necessarily confined to something we say. But it's, a, it's, it's something that we're going to practically do it. We're going to practically um, affirm and negate. Or negate and affirm. So how do, what do we negate? Anybody have any idea what we would negate? Any partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay, we'll negate partners with Allah, but... Okay, that's good. We'll negate partners with Allah. What else will we negate? Anything that goes against the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that goes against the oneness of Allah, we'll negate it. Anything else? What else will we negate? Ah, Anything that can be worshipped besides Allah? Anything could be worshipped besides Allah, we'll negate it. Good. Sure. Let me answer this question. Um, does Allah have s certain qualities that only He has? Yes. Yes. So are we going to negate those qualities? No. Yeah, we'll negate them, but what? Yeah. From other than Allah. We'll negate them from other than Allah. You guys, you guys follow me what I mean by negate? Mm -hmm. So everything which is specific to Allah, we're going to negate it from other than Allah. We're going to deny that anyone other than Allah has that. So that's part of a tawheed. The first part is what? We negate that anyone has what? This quality, this ability, this, um, this entitlement. We negate that from other than Allah. And everything you said was right, but this is also a, 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 a concept I want to make sure you understand as well. It's not just that we negate partners with Allah, or we negate shirk, or we negate um, polytheism, but we negate what? From others, that they have what? What is specific to Allah. Okay? Is that clear? Any questions about that? This is the nefi side, the negation side. Fadli. Okay, so is that the same as I've uh, seen brothers who will name themselves Ar-Rahman or Rahim, so we just don't even call them that. We just no, they shouldn't name themselves, especially a name like Ar-Rahman, which yeah. is definitely specific to Allah. There's no ishtiraq. See, you have some names where there may be what? Commonality. Like Ar-Rashid. Ar-Rashid. This is a name where you've had people who've been named this and the scholars have not disapproved of it, even though it's a name of Allah, right? right. Or there are some other names. For example, Al-Malik, the king. You follow me? The king. So these are names where there could be what? Commonality. There could be ishtiraq. But you have some names there could be no commonality, like Ar-Rahman. Yes. There's no commonality. This is a name which is specific to Allah. There's no way that it could be used... It could be, you know, there could be any commonality. Same thing with what Allah. You follow me? Nobody should name themselves Allah, for example. All right? So we negate that from other than Allah. Back up. But, so we have, the, we have the concept of a nafi, ya khuat. Is that clear? Ya khuan, a nafi, that's clear? 
negation. So then after that, once we negate, we have to do what? Simultaneously, we have to affirm. It's back. We have to make it back. We have to affirm. And the way we affirm is whatever we negate it from other than Allah, we do what? We affirm it for Allah. So those names of Allah which are specific to Him, we affirm them to who? Allah alone. And those attributes, qualities of Allah, we affirm to Allah alone. And those what? Those acts that He can do, those actions that He can perform, and only He can perform. We affirm them to who? Allah, and we negate them for other than Allah, and so on. So now look at the, the sub-bullets, effectiveness. This is the most effective method. What makes it so effective? Uh, of those affirmations has to be based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has signed for himself. Yeah, for sure. So for sure. So we have to have... not only what we negate from other people, eh. from others that we affirm mm -hmm. to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Eh. So uh, Jazakallah khair. That's a, good, uh, that's a good point that you make. That obviously whatever we're affirming is not something we're affirming because we think it makes sense. It's, we're affirming it because Allah has affirmed it for himself. Jazakallah khair. Mm -hmm. So now effectiveness. Why is this such an effective method? Because what, what are you doing effectively? You are wiping the slate what? Clean. clean. You're wiping the slate clean. There can be no shirk because what? You wipe the slate what? Clean. And then you do what? You affirm to Allah alone. So that's the why it's so effective because you wipe the slate clean. You free yourself of what? Any form of shirk, any type of associating partners or make, setting up rivals with Allah. And then you do what? You affirm what is specific to Allah to Allah alone. You wipe the slate clean clean chalkboard, and then you do what? You affirm whatever belongs to Allah, you affirm it to Him and Him alone. That's why it's so effective. Then look at the next bullet. It says, a shahada What is the shahada What's the first part of the shahada team? Okay, so what, what is that? Okay, it's a testification, but what is the wording? What do we actually say? Right. an la ilaha illallah. That's the first half of it, right? Okay, so that statement, La ilaha illallah, it's also known as what? Kalimat at tawheed the slogan of monotheism. Why is it called that? Why is it called the slogan of monotheism? Because it is the best phrase to represent what? The reality of a tawheed. And if you look at it, it consists of what? Negation and affirmation. The first part of it, La ilaha. There is no God. There's no deity worthy of worship. So what does that do? Wipes the slate clean. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. No one is going to be worshipped. No one. Absolutely no one. Then what? Illallah. Except Allah. You guys see that? So that's why this is considered Kalimat Tawheed, the slogan of a Tawheed, because one, it's the best way to what? To summarize and to express what? This concept. The concept of Tawheed, which is what? Founded on the concept of a Nafi, Negation and what? It's bad. Affirmation. Soon by that it says, or we just mentioned that this is something that we covered last week in the chapter under what? The explanation of a tawheed and testimony of faith or the testimony of la ilaha And what he was getting at was that this concept of a nafi wa fat, which is the founding principle behind the tawheed, is something which permeates the religious texts. When you read the Quran, when you read the Sunnah, it's going to be filled with what? Negating what is rightfully the what is rightfully the entitlement of Allah to other than Allah, and then what? Affirming it for Allah. It permeates. And he gave us like five five examples. All right, any questions for that section? Any questions for that section? Brothers, any questions? Akhawat, sisters, any questions on that? Don't be afraid, don't be shy. So right now, if I gave you a test on this, you'd... Pass it with flying colors, 100%, everybody. Everybody. I mean, without the paper. Closed book. Huh? So if you guys have questions on anything that we covered thus far, ask me. Otherwise, we'll go on to the next next section. Play. All right, that said, the next thing is the categories of a Tawheed. Categories. So Tawheed has what? It has categories. It's not just one category, but it has what? It has categories. So the first category is what? Tawheed al rububiyyah Tawheed al rububiyyah And that is the Tawheed of, or they translate it as what? The Tawheed of Lordship. The Tawheed of 
lordship. And this Tawheed is specific to Allah's actions. This first Tawheed, Tawheed al is what they call Tawheed Allah, Tawifrad Allah bi af'ali, or bi kulli ma yakhtasuhu min laf'al. It is singling out Allah in everything which is specific to Him from what? From His actions. So just remember that Rububiyya, Lordship, is related to what? The things that Allah does that nobody else does. The things that Allah does that nobody else does or can do. For example, no one can create from, from nothing. Except who? Allah. No one can create from nothing except Allah. So that's one, that's one action that would fall into what? Tawheed al-Rububiyya. Another example is no one decrees. You guys know what we mean by decree, right? Mm -hmm. They destiny. Like, write your destiny. What's going to happen to you, right? No one can do that except who? Allah. Allah. Um, no one can give life except who? Allah. No one can cause what? Death except Allah. So this is all related to what? Actions that he does that no one else can do. And there are many others, but that's an example, or those are some examples, to make it clear to you what we mean by Tawheed al So now we sing out Allah and what? All of these actions, which is specific to Him, we do what? We affirm them for Him and we negate them for who? From everyone else. And this has to be not something that we just say, but practically speaking. You guys understand what I mean by practically speaking? I'll give you an example. A person says, Wallahi, I believe in Allah's, or I believe in the Tawheed of Allah's Rububiyyah. Allah is the only what? is the only one who creates from nothing. He's the only one who can give life and cause death. So he says that. But then he goes to the grave of someone who's deceased. And he prays to that person in the grave, Oh so and so in the grave, give me a child. Make my wife, who's barren, make her what? Give birth to a child. So now he says with his tongue that he believes what? in Allah's Tawheed or His Rububiyya mm -hmm. that He is the only one who what? Who creates and who provides and who gives life and causes death. But practically speaking, He's demonstrating what? That He doesn't believe in this Tawheed because He's what? He's asking someone to give life who cannot what? Give life. You guys follow that? Mm -hmm. So this can't be just something we give lip service to but something we have to what? We have to practically demonstrate our belief that what? Allah is what? He's the only one who creates from nothing. He's the only one who gives life and causes death, etc. طيب ثم بعد ذلك توحيد الله في أسمائه والصفات or توحيد in الأسماء والصفات. So this is what his names and attributes. So Allah has we talked about this a little bit. We touched on this. Allah يبارك فيك. Because he's sleeping, right? Allah is there. Allah you كريمك. Anybody take a cup that means know that they were they were falling asleep. Yeah. Okay, we'll see Allah yukrimak, Allah yukrimak, Allah <laughs> No, you can have it, Habib. It's okay. We won't believe that you were falling asleep. We won't believe that. This is one thing. Is it sweetened? <laughs> he says it's sweetened. La ilaha illallah. Oh, la ilaha illallah. All right, so... So we said the Tawheed of Allah in His names and attributes, then that relates to what? The names, which are specifically His, and the attributes that are specifically His. Those qualities that only He possesses. Like the quality of what? Sama and Ba'idat. Hearing things which are what? Which are far away and not in the proximity of the hearer. What is people speaking? And you know it was a lot of the sisters, you know that's a big problem. You guys have tea, it doesn't mean you're sleeping. Even the teacher. I'm going to have some, yeah, I'm going to take some too. I was falling asleep too. Alright, so, so we said the example of, of his qualities, his sifat, would be like the quality of Allah to hear things which are not in his proximity. So, for example, here we are, and Allah is what? Above the throne, in a man that befits his majesty. And he's near to us in terms of what? His knowledge, 
and his hearing and his seeing and his what? His support and his aid for the believers. But he's not in our proximity, right? But he hears what? He hears everything. If we go into a dark place and there's lots of noise and we whisper and no one can hear us, Allah can hear us. Tayyib. So this is a quality which only Allah has. And we can't give this quality to what? To other than Allah. And it's not something we can just give lip service to. Again, we said practically speaking. So you have a person, for example, who he's in the U.S. and he's in a jam. In the U.S., in a jam, and he cries out and he says, Ya Abdul Qadr al Jilani, aghithni. He says, Oh Abdul Qadr al Jilani, rescue me, save me. Is Abdul Qadr al Jilani in his proximity? No. So when he does that, practically, what is he saying? That Abdul Qadr al Jilani can hear me even though what? I'm not in his proximity, I'm far away from him. So this is what a type of shirk. And people don't realize it, but that's what it is. It's a type of shirk. Let alone what? What, what comes after that? Aghithni. Okay, rescue me. Hmm? Abdul Qadr al Jilani? He's one of the people that a lot of people believe he's a saint and that he's close to Allah. And so either their dua will have more barakah if they use him as a wasila, or they use him as an intermediary, or they actually believe that he's able to what? He's able to fulfill their request on their behalf. So he's a person that many people believe is a saint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's an example of what al-asma wa sifat, tawheed al-asma wa sifat. And what that basically, what we say is, is that we have to sing out Allah in those names and attributes which are specific to him. Practically, not just verbally, but practically. So the example we gave is that hearing things which are far away is something, a quality which only Allah has. And so we can't give that quality, whether verbally or practically, to anyone besides Allah. But then by that, we have, uh, yeah, okay. All right, we have Tawheed al uluhiyah or Tawheed al ibadah Singling out Allah in terms of what? The actions that we do, which are specific to Him. And what acts do human beings do which are specific to Allah? Okay, Salat, what else? Fasting, what else? Huh? A shahada, okay, Hajj, Zakat. All of these are in what? In a circle. All of them are, fall under one category. Salat, Zakat, Siyam, Hajj, Tawaf, Dabah. All of them fall into one category, one word. Worship, Mumtaz. So the actions that we do which is specific to Allah and that we have to single Allah out in those actions are what? Acts of worship. So Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, what is it? It is singling out Allah in terms of what? The actions that we do which are specific to Him. Singly out Allah, ifradullahi bima yakhtassu bihi min af'al al-ibad. Singling out Allah in those actions that we do, which are specific to Him. And those are, and you can put it in parentheses, the acts of worship. So if you notice, there's a correlation between Tawheed al-Rububiyyah and Tawheed al-Ilahiyyah. There's a correlation. What's the correlation? What's the correlation? What did we say Tawheed Rububiya was? His actions, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Singing out Allah with respect to what? His actions. Mm -hmm. And Tawheed al ibadah singing out Allah in terms of what? Mm -hmm. Our actions. So remember that correlation. Rububiya, his actions. Uluhiya, our actions, which are specific to him. Tayyip. All right, then after that, We'll talk a little bit about ibadah itself. Talk a little bit about an ibadah. Any questions though before we go on? Do you guys understand what we mean by Tawheed al Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat, the Tawheed of Allah's Lordship, the Tawheed of His names and attributes, and the Tawheed of His worship? Is that pretty clear? Mumtaz. All right, let's go on then to what? Al ibadah. What is an ibadah? And this is important too because a lot of people, they do things which are shirk. And they say, I'm not worshipping anything besides Allah. And the reason why they think they're not worshipping anything besides Allah is because they don't know what? 
what ibadah is, what constitutes ibadah, how ibadah is not just salat. Ibadah is what? It's a huge circle that encompasses many things that we don't think are worship, but they're actually worship. So an ibadah, what is an ibadah? Ibn Taymiyyah, he defined it, and he, defined, he defined it thusly. He said, Ismun jami'un li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allahu wa yardah min laf'al wal aqwal al zahira wal batina. What does that mean in English? He said, al ibadah is a comprehensive term. A comprehensive term which encompasses everything that Allah loves and is pleased with. A comprehensive term that encompasses everything that Allah loves and is pleased with. Ismun jami'un li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yardah. من الأقوال والأعمال الظاهرة والباطنة. What does that mean in English? It is a comprehensive term which encompasses everything that Allah loves and is pleased with. From statements and actions, whether hidden or apparent, whether hidden or apparent. Let me say it again. Whether hidden, something that other people don't see, or apparent, things that are what? Done publicly and people can see. So that makes it a pretty big circle, doesn't it? Makes it encompass a lot more things than just what? Salat. So what that tells you is that anything that Allah loves and is pleased with is actually what ibadah. So let me ask this question. If a person, if a person brushes their teeth in the morning, they brush their teeth, just get up and they're like, oh, man, that garlic from last night, I need to sort that out, I need to deal with that. So they brush their teeth, right? Okay? They brush their teeth. Is that ibadah? Oh, she said no. Is it Ibadah? Yeah. Who says yes? Let me see, show of hands, yes. No, if they use mist, like, yeah. no, they just brush. Or they use some floss. Depends. Dental Depends. floss. Depends. Is it Ibadah? Yeah. Depends on your knee. I'm saying the act itself, because obviously the knee will de determine everything. Do you think so? Yeah. I think so too, you know why? Because the Prophet said in the Hadith, he said, he said, um, what's the Hadith? He said, um, what is that, what is the? I'm trying to think the word, first word of it. But he said in the hadith, he said, as siwak, huh? Uh, I thought you were talking about the hadith about garlic. No, no, he said, as siwak, matharatun lil fam, maradatun lil shay, lil rab. He said, as siwak, and don't take the word siwak literally. Yeah, he used the word siwak, miswak, but what he meant was what? The cleansing of the teeth. He said the cleansing of the teeth, a siwak, is what? Mutaharatun lil fam. It is something which purifies what? The mouth gets rid of that bad smell. Mardatun lil shay. The rub. It's something that pleases what? Pleases the Lord. Pleases Allah. So it pleases. When our mouths are fresh, we have a fresh smelling mouth, it what? It pleases Allah. So as the brother mentioned, Sahih, the, the, the niyyah comes into it, but the act itself is an act of what? Worship. And if we have the niyyah which accompanies it, that, that's what? That's what, what? Raise it to Allah and make it what? Rewardable. But the act itself is, is worship, even though it's just what? Brushing your teeth, something you're going to do anyway, inshallah, right? <laughs> so, you guys see how worship is not just what? Salat. So, another, so anything that we do that pleases Allah, whether it's a statement or an action, it's what? It will what? It will be worship. Okay? Tayyib. So this is important. So what are the implications of this? What are the implications of this definition? The implication of this definition is like this. Anything that Allah... No, basically let me say this first. When we talk about the things that Allah loves, that could be what? Divide into what? Into two categories. 
things that Allah loves that we actually what? Do it. But also things that Allah loves that we do what? That we leave it. So that means that ibadah can be divided into what? Two categories. Things that Allah loves that we do, and that's what? Two levels. Things which are what? Obligatory, we have to do them, or we expose ourselves to punishment. And things that we are encouraged to do, we won't be punished if we leave them, but we'll get what? Reward for doing them. On the other side of the spectrum, you have things that Allah loves that we what? That we leave, that we avoid. And those are two levels. Things that we have to avoid or we expose, a lot, we expose ourselves to Allah's punishment, which is what? Something which is haram. So if we leave it, we get a reward. And things which what? We are encouraged to leave, but we don't have to leave. And if we leave, we'll get a reward, but if we do, we're going to be punished. And those are what? Makuhat. So ibadah could be what? Something haram or makuh that we do what? We leave. And we leave it intentionally, we get what? We're worshipping Allah. So a person walks past what? A liquor store. And he willfully walks past and doesn't want Enter and doesn't buy wine. Right? And internally he feels what? A sense of disgust that people drink this stuff. Right? He's actually doing what? Worshipping Allah. He's actually worshipping Allah at that point, at that moment. Because he's leaving something which Allah loves that what? It be left. You guys understand that? All right. طيب. Any questions about that? All right, let's go. We're going to finish this section and we'll stop. And then we'll start the next section next week and then go back to the book, hopefully, inshallah. طيب. So the last two bullets is that ibadah is performed by what? The heart, the tongue, and the limbs. This is important too. Because some people say, oh, I'm not committing shirk because what? I didn't do anything physically. I didn't do anything physically. But we said that worship is what? Anything Allah loves and is pleased with from what? Statements and actions which are what? Hidden and apparent. So not just things we physically do that people can see, but what? Even things we do internally. So for example, if we love someone the way only Allah should be loved, then this will be what? This will be a type of what? Shirk. The person says, well, I didn't, I didn't worship him, I didn't prostrate to him. No, but you're what? You're giving him something which is entitled to Allah, a type of love or a level of love which is only entitled to what? Which only Allah is entitled to. And where does love come from? The tongue? The limbs? Not the heart. So that goes to show you that the heart what? Has a role, the heart worships. And if the heart worships other than Allah, you're guilty of what? Shirk. The tongue. The tongue makes certain statements. And some of those statements are only befitting for Allah. So if the tongue makes those statements and they attribute them to other than Allah, then what? That will be active. The tongue committing what? Shirk. So for example, when the, the tongue makes what? Dua. Call, it calls out, it supplicates and asks for things. If the tongue asks for things, like for example, Oh Allah, give me a son. Oh Allah, um, grant me health. Oh Allah, save me from this calamity. All those are what? Acts of what? Worship by what? By the tongue. So the tongue what? Worships Allah. Like you have a question, huh? You said if someone asks Allah for a child, that's mm -hmm. that's the tongue. That's worship. Anytime we ask Allah for anything, it's worship. Let me ask you a question. Remember what we said. Remember what we said. What is worship? No, I didn't say it was shirk. I said it was worship. I said it was worship, not shirk. Oh, okay. That's what I thought. I was like, okay. Because, and this is good too. I'm glad this came out. I'm glad this came out. Why? Allah loves when we ask Him. He loves when we ask Him. This is one of the greatest acts of worship. And this is the amazing thing about Allah. When you ask people, what happens? They get annoyed. They get vexed. Oh, man. What? They, they let you down. Or, but even before letting you down, they just what? They get vexed. They don't like to be asked for anything. They don't be asked to ask for their time. They don't like to be asked for their money. They don't ask for their advice. Whatever it is. No matter how easy it is for them to give, they don't like to, be, they don't like to give. But if you ask Allah, He actually what? 
he gets happy. It pleases him when you ask him, and it angers him when you don't ask him. To the point that he commands you to ask him. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ اُدْعُونِي Then he promises you, أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord says, call upon me. He asks you to call upon him. أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ I will answer you. He promises you, he will answer just reassures you. Don't think I'm going to let you down, or I'm going to be vexed like the other people. And this is the thing too. Sometimes we do things, we let Allah down. We disappoint Allah by our deeds. And then when we disappoint Allah by our deeds, we feel hesitant to what? To ask Him. Just like if you're your parents. You disappoint Him, you do something wrong, you feel what? Shy after doing that to what? To ask Him for something. Same thing. So we disappoint Allah with Him down there, we feel shy to what? To ask. Even when we do that, He wants us to what? To ask. And not to think, well, he won't answer because I did this sin or I made this mistake, etc. We should still ask. And we should ask and be confident he'll answer. Why? Because he answered who? Who did he answer? He answered a shaitan. Qala, um, what is the ayah? What is the ayah? Help me. Uh, he said, um, Qala Rabbi, anvirni ila yom yubatun. Qala innaka. He said, Oh my Lord, give me respite until the day when what? They are resurrected. He said, You are from the people who have been given respite. Shuf, shaitan. Shaitan asked Allah and he what? He granted his dua. So this is the thing, is I don't about the I don't get that point because I don't know. I think I think it will the at me, you know, one of the principles of da'a that you make da'a and something good. Uh -huh. You can't make da'a for something bad. No, we didn't say anything about making anything bad. What I'm, the point I'm trying know, to make is, is that... My point is, huh? Shaitan didn't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something good. He asked for, for an extended life so he can, he can take us all to hell. Hey, so but when he asked him, regardless of his niyyah, when he asked Allah, did Allah grant it or not? Yes, but it wasn't du'a. It wasn't du'a? No. If you ask Allah, what do you call it then? What is du'a? When you ask Allah for something. He asked Allah. So that's the thing is that when you look at that, if the shaitan asks Allah, and Allah will grant it, and he's the shaitan. So one of us, none of us is the shaitan. We might be weak, we might do the wrong thing, but none of us is the shaitan. So we should have every um, hope, every, we have right, every right to hope that Allah will do what? Will answer us. That's the point. That's the whole point. Does that make sense or no? I get the point. I don't get the example. You don't get the example. Okay. But, all right, so the last thing is two categories of ibadah, and this is important. Because what did we just say? We just said that what? Dua is what? Ibadah. But don't we call on people too? In this world? Don't we call on people? Don't we say, hey, uh, hey, Ahmed, come here. And I just did, what would I just do? I called him. And we call upon Allah. So now, what does that tell us about ibadah? That tells us that some acts of worship, they're what? Mushtaraka. They're not just, they're offered to Allah and they're offered to what? Human beings. And some acts of worship are what we call mahba. They're just what? They're totally devotional acts and they can only be what? Offered to who? Allah. So, this is important for us to... to pay attention to too because we don't want to be hasty and labeling something what? Shirk, when it's not shirk. So how do we differentiate? First of all, you have acts of worship which that's they're purely acts of worship, purely devotional. They can't be anything else. Like what? Like salat. Like a sujood. These are devotional acts. So which means that a person can never what? Prostrate to anyone other than Allah. You have acts like that. And then you have acts like a dua, calling, love, al mahabba, loving. Okay? I love my mother. Okay? And I'm not committing a shirk, but I'm also supposed to love who? Allah. And I love Allah. Okay? So now you have these acts which we call mushtaraka. They're what? They're shared. They could be, in some instances, they're ibadah, in some instances, they're not ibadah. So how do we differentiate? There's a certain type of love which is specific to who? 
Allah. And so that's the love we have to give to who Allah is. Allah says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ I'm sorry, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ and دَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ And from the people are those who they take rivals or partners. They love them and they should only love Allah. وَالَّذِينَ آمُنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ And those who believe, what? Love Allah more than anything else. So it's okay to love your mother, love your spouse, love your children, but you love them what? With that what? That, um, that natural love. But the divine love, the love which is only for Allah, then you can only love that, give that love to Allah. A dua, calling. You call upon people in this world who what? Who can hear you and who can respond to you who can respond to you, and you ask them for things which they are humanly capable of what? Of giving. That's the dua which is acceptable what? In this world amongst the creation. And when we call upon Allah, we call upon Him what? For those things which what? Which befit Him, and only He can, he can do. And so that's the difference between what? The two categories of what? Ibadah. The first one being what? Mahba, purely devotional. And the second one being what? Mushtaraka. Mushtaraka. All right, any questions? And we'll stop there. Any questions? Mushtaraka means uh, shared. Something to that effect. Any questions about anything we covered from top to bottom? Did the visual help? Having the visual? Okay, so we'll try to be consistent with that. I'll try to bring a study guide every week. And then hopefully, um, hopefully we'll go from there. Any questions? Yes. Uh, the father, Sheikh Nayyad. Yeah. Like the uh, at the saint, saint, for instance. Uh huh. Is that it's like a, is a long term or personal? Well, that's something that people yeah. have basically borrowed from other religious traditions okay. and brought it into Islam. But it, no, it's not acceptable. Okay. It's not acceptable, okay. but it's something that people have what they okay. innovated, they brought into Islam. Borrowing it from other religious traditions, the concept of what? Saints. People who are so holy and so pious that you can ask them for your needs or they can intercede on, or they can intercede for you. I'm sorry. They can intercede with you on Allah's behalf. I'm sorry, they can intercede with Allah on your behalf like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> More stuff, huh? I have an announcement for your close please. Inshallah the class start here. Change from after Aisha to after Maghrib. In case somebody wants to show up tomorrow, when Abla Day keeps the shaitan away, oh, <laughs> any questions? Any questions? Nahba. <laughs> Ah, mahba, mahba, mim, ha, bad, tamabuta, m a h d a h, I guess, mahba, mah, mah, mim, mah, mahba, the bad, the sister of sad. Hans, father, you have to it. Okay, so you want the English of that? Yes, please. You mentioned for the VI was specific to Allah's action, and for the Muslim was specific to our action towards Allah. Okay, good. I didn't get the middle one. Ah, Al-Asma wa Sifat means what? His names? The names which are specific to him? And Al-Sifat? Well, I'll, I'll eat it. I'll put it in my oatmeal. I'll take it. It's like, it should come soon. But, and the sifat are the qualities that are specific to him. The qualities are specific to him. Wallahi Ibrahim, I think if you do the tafsir of that ayah. I, I just looked it up. Because yeah. I've seen it before in Kitab al Tabari. The ulama say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most of the ulama, uh -huh. uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't answer his question or his dua or whatever no, it's called. No, I don't know about yeah. that. Because there's a quote. I want to say it's from Sufi and the Thawri. I'm going to read it for you. Okay. And 
that's one of the ulama that went against uh-huh. the ulama. Hey, they say, hey. 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 فقد طلب إبليس الإنظار إلى يوم البعث وقد أعطاه الله الإنظار إلى يوم المعلوم وأكثر العلماء يقولون المراد به وقت النفخة الأولى قال ربي فانظرني إلى يوم المعلوم قال إنك من المنظرين إلى يوم الوقت المعلوم فهي إلى يوم يبعثون والله سبحانه وتعالى قيبهم أن ترى يوم الوقت المعلوم العلماء العلماء سيدة those are two different he wanted not to taste death at all let me ask this question. Let me ask this question. Huh? I didn't mean to be arguing with him. Huh? Mahda. Mahda? Like. Mahda. 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 Hey. He better Mahda. Hey. Did you ask him? I didn't. I was. I'm sorry. I was answering you for him. Sorry. Sorry. But I go. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, right? I'm not arguing. No, I'm just saying. No, no. I remembered it. Because it's what lies on arguing. I appreciate it. Exactly. Here. What I'm saying is this: is that let's just say for the sake of argument. Okay. He gave. He asked for this, and he gave him this. It's just like if you um, you ask Allah for something, and you don't get everything you ask for, but you get, you know, something you ask for because of the hikmah that Allah knows that if you got everything you asked for, it wouldn't be good for you. You follow me? You still want? It's still the tijaba. So wallahi, an amir al al qul akhir shi. This is in a wal bayan fath al qadir wal baqi. But again, the master lahumuna. At the end of the day, we want to, we're concerned with what? The, the, the <laughs> I, I just, yeah. I, I just remembered it. So. But it's good. It's a good point. Exactly. Like, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I just, again, it's this Java. If you look at it, just practically speaking, you he asked, he answered, he gave. Him. It's that's this Java. Yeah, that's what I what was best. But you did say it's what? Old Fanny. Eh? Well, it says that he asked for Ilayumi Batun. Eh? In, uh, Sheikh Al Baghawi, I think he says that he didn't want to die at all. Eh? But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave him until eh? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala قَالَ فَقَالَ فَإِنَّكَ مِنَ الْمُنْظَرِينَ لَيَوْمِ الْوَقْتِ الْمَعْلُومِ. Eh? العلماء say the day of the time is the time of the first one. Jamil. So he got until the first one. Eh? He doesn't get until everybody's raised, so he doesn't die. But that doesn't mean that his 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 dua wasn't mustajab. You follow what I'm saying? Allah. That's what I'm saying. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. Ah, tafadlu. Ah, tafadlu. What's uh? Mahba means like it's it's absolute or totally, purely. So if we say ibadah mahba, purely devotional act means that it's not something which what it can be anything other than a devotional act. Does that answer it, or does it need more clarity? Who asked? Because they're all looking like. Was it me? <laughs> hey. So about the mahpa. If you shake, anything else? Yeah. So when it comes to shirk, okay, and you're speaking of like martial arts, um, when they bow at the end of or beginning of hey. a fight or whatever, so is that shirk? And if it is, what type of shirk? Is it? But if you the bowing is what? It's an ibadah. It's an ibadah. And so a Muslim should not what? bow or prostrate to anyone besides Allah and it can be what major shirk especially if a person there's no what there's no coercion there's nothing forcing the person to what to bow so it will be just like if a person made tawaf they like circled around something as an act of worship this is this type of tawaf circling around something it's specific to the Kaaba and it's specific to who Allah. So a person can't say, well, I'm making tawaf elsewhere, it's not ibadah. It's going to be ibadah. Because it's what? Ibadah mahfa. It's purely devotional. So the same thing with bowing. So if a person were to study martial arts, they would have to kind of have some reach some type of understanding with the person who's leading the dojo or whatever that, you know, we don't, I don't bow. And I think they'll, they'll acquiesce. I think they will. Ah, tafadun, please. Why this issue, as we understand that when a person supplicates, ask Allah something, 
He may give him what he wants. He may give him some of what some of what he wants. He may do not give him, and he may give it for him for the day of judgment. Ahsan. So even if we say that Allah did not answer it as the Shaitan want, He had give him a portion of what, of what he, he wants. Does that Allah is best. I appreciate that. Does that Allah is best. Please remember everybody the class has changed and it's going to be after Maghrib. It's going to be, inshallah, less than an hour, so we don't have to make tea to wake up the people. <laughs> so if you would like to do it, those who could not make it because just coming back from work and you want to eat, you can join adlionline.com and you can see it live, inshallah. We broadcast the live. Both classes. So the Tarbi is Wednesday or? What day is it's it on? Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, okay. but instead of after Isha, that would be between Maghrib and Isha. Maghrib and Isha. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah fiqh wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak. Anna bin Muhammad. Did you say you want to change your class to Saturday? Um, I mean, there was some discussion about it. I guess I have to see uh, what the... Okay.